we've got a fun show here, so we're obviously going to talk about the championship games. But there are also a bunch of teams that are not still in the tournament, and they are looking forward to free agency and the draft. And so we're going to talk uh, top 10 free agents, do a little Joe Brady conversation. Nice. We're going to talk about the draft, the 2016 draft, and kind of what we can learn maybe from looking back mm -hmm. on what might happen this year. And then we're going to get into uh, the championship games, look at whether you want to bet on futures, talk about each game, and then some of the potential Super Bowl matchups. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right, let's start with this. Top 10 free agents. Number three, since we're doing a little snake draft here, I'm going to stick with... Um, wide receivers i thought you were going to take amari cooper um in which case i would have i would have taken byron jones here but i'm going to go with aj green okay and i would put aj green ahead of amari cooper if it weren't for the injury concern but because of the injury concern i actually think it makes him potentially a little bit bigger of a, a bargain mm -hmm. you're gonna have to give amari cooper um uh, you know you would think a lot more of an investment and this is the guy that i would love to see go to the patriots because they're a little bit of an older team, and I think he would take, he would probably value the opportunity having lived in Cincinnati for his entire life or uh, pro career to compete for uh, a championship. Let's move on to the 2016 draft. So let's just go, let's read, I'm gonna read through the top 10 from the 2016 yep. draft, and I want your take on it, and then we're gonna spin it forward. What are, we, what are we learning from the 2016 draft about this year's draft? So looking at this, I, I sort of, you know, you go through and rank them. And it's a really interesting insight. So, and we're not going to go through the whole ranking. You no, have to go to the website. The but the top four teams are really interesting, right? Top four teams are New Orleans, Kansas City, Atlanta, and Tennessee. A couple things here, right? The interesting thing with New Orleans is you talked about Sheldon Rankins was their top pick. And he's a good football player. But their second pick is really what elevated them here. Michael Thomas, a wide receiver, uh, worth about uh, four-fifths of a win this year. And he was drafted after Josh Doxson. He was drafted after Corey Coleman. He was drafted after Laquan Treadwell. And, you know, has ended up, you know, overcoming all of those players probably combined uh, to be that type of, um, uh, to be that type of uh, player. So my, my top five picks here, here's how I think the top <laughs> five in this, this draft go. Joe Burrow trade up for Tua. The Detroit Lions stay at three. They take Chase Young who is great, but their coverage goes to crap in a couple of years, so it, it ultimately doesn't matter as much. Number four, by the way, you should go check out Mike's mock draft. It's mm -hmm. a little different than this. Number four, this is my favorite pick in, of everything. CeeDee Lamb goes to New York. He it, Daniel Jones elevates himself into Jameis territory where he's just going 30-30 every year, but CeeDee Lamb is a monster yeah. in that offense. And then at number five, I can't imagine the Dolphins lose that bidding war for Tua, but if they do and they're stuck at five, I think they probably pull the trigger on uh, on your boy Herbs. Yeah, which would be crazy. I I, I would I would trade down in that spot, um, you know, or take maybe an Isaiah Simmons or a uh, you know well, that, Jerry that, Judy you, or something. You explain it well. If you need a if you if you are at that position, a trade down is probably the best. If you have to take a player there quarterback's not a terrible one it's just that these particular quarterbacks you know may not be uh the strongest now big drop off some some things to learn from the bottom half of this group right the bottom five drafts in 2016 28 was seattle i said that for better or worse they yielded two starters along the offensive line and jermaine effetti and joey hunt what it shows is that if you have a quarterback not much matters you know with seattle Indianapolis, this was the last pre-Chris uh, Ballard draft. Again, they drafted four offensive linemen, only one place for them anymore. Cleveland had a lot of picks, and most of them sucked. Uh, San Francisco, again, a team that's on the doorstep of the Super Bowl right now. This was, again, their last pre-John Lynch draft, showing, again, that if you resolve the quarterback position, you get the head coach being good, and you value the right things, you can overcome terrible drafts. And their draft, I mean, they drafted Joshua Garnett in the first round, you know, Will Redmond in the third, Richard Robinson, they traded like immediately you after. Just, is the reason that you're extending this conversation just to talk to me about this Niners draft? No, because I'm, I'm saying that is, you can it? overcome it. And then lastly, the Stone Woat draft, which is Tampa Bay, drafted, as you said, Vernon Hargreaves at 11, traded up in the second round for Roberto Aguayo. We're on to the conference championship. You ready? Um, let's go. All right. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is, let's say you're sitting here right now. Actually, a buddy of mine uh, texted me uh, during the, the divisional 
games. He's like, is anyone good to bet on to to win the Super Bowl right now? Yes. And we have talked about this a lot over the past couple of weeks. Like, who would you, you know, like, let's look forward in the future. But right now, looking forward in the future isn't that far down the yes. road. And so the prices on futures right now don't make sense because it's not you're not waiting that long. Yep. So you're almost better. You're better off just saying, let me bet a little now. And let me bet a little on the Super Bowl. Here's, here's the big takeaway yeah. that I have from this, which is if you didn't do this this year, think about this for next year. Yep. This is why you bet futures ahead of time. Yep. Because, so right now, here's the situation I'm in. I had I had Super Bowl futures on the Niners and the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. I also had the Saints. Uh, I believe I had the Falcons. <laughs> but Of course you did. Right, of course. <laughs> but I'm sitting in a really great spot because the two favorites to go to the Super Bowl, I have great odds and you have them yes far better odds than they currently are far better so now what i'm doing is i'm looking to hedge in particular games and and i can do the so i can get value on a green bay money line as a hedge for my you know for one of my bets basically mm -hmm. but also if i win that i'm getting essentially this better than current future value bet because i can roll it over yeah. and also be hedging in all likelihood Against the you end up in a situation where you aren't hedging out of necessity, but instead hedging out of that there's actually value because yeah. you shouldn't hedge unless, unless like your financial situation is such that you need the money. You should never hedge a bet unless the unless the bet that you're about to place has positive expected value. OK, so we've got Green Bay going back to San Francisco. Seven and a half point underdog, which is very interesting because Minnesota was. A seven-point underdog obviously got, you know, their doors kicked in. Yep. Um, and the question, the the first question that I ask myself is, okay, I think Aaron Rodgers is a better quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo. Now, yep. Say what you will about family relationships, about ability to trim their beard. Unbelievable. About uh, choices in significant others. Put that all aside. I think Aaron Rodgers on the football field is the guy I'd rather have. But I'd rather have the San Francisco offense. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have the environment on offense that the, that the Niners have. So the question to me is, like, I know how important the quarterback is. Am I overrating it because actually the result of what he does is much less for the mm -hmm. Packers than it is for the Niners? And, and, and is that worth me being scared off of seven and a half? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, there's a significant issue with the Packers offense, which is that they have one guy to throw to, uh, and, and possibly one and a half if you count Jimmy Graham. And the 49ers, unlike Seattle, are going to take full advantage of that. Okay, so this one, is it now seven? It is seven. It's been bet down a little bet bit. Bet down, and this, this surprises me a little bit. Uh, does it surprise you? Uh, yeah, I, you know, the thing about it is, is you know, the the Chiefs finished as a five point favorite in Tennessee the last time they played. Now that was the Chiefs' last loss, and you know, so if you add the six points for home field advantage, we'd be back at eleven now, and now we're seeing four. So it has has the have these numbers adjusted four points? I think there's a lot of overreaction to Tennessee beating a Baltimore team that many thought was the, was the league's best. Let me say this. The, so the last time Tennessee and Kansas City played was when Pat Mahomes had just come back from injury. And Mahomes was awesome. Mm -hmm. Over eight yards per attempt from a clean pocket. He made that incredible jump pass. I believe it was to Hardman. Um, mm -hmm. And he, I think he took it and made it like 30-22 or something like that. Yep. He was awesome. So was Ryan Tannehill. But here's the difference between these two guys. Ryan Tannehill in that game, I have it here. Ryan Tannehill in that game, he threw... Was it 15 passes? 19 passes. He, Ryan Tannehill has not yet had to be a volume thrower of the football. He mm. hasn't had to drop back much in, this, in these playoffs. I don't think you can... Uh, the, the way that the Chiefs play the game of football, you're going to have to drop back and throw the ball. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about with Ryan Tannehill, he takes sacks at the highest rate in the league. Do you know who takes it at one of the lowest rates? Pat Mahomes, Mahomes. Yeah, which, which is so, it's what makes him, we talked about when you drafted quarterbacks. The difference between Pat Mahomes and Russell Wilson isn't the high end of variance. They can both make amazing plays. 
It's that Mahomes just refuses to make negative ones. Mm -hmm. The dude is supremely active from a clean pocket. He scrambles, he takes hits, but he does not take sacks. And to me, that is the difference in this game. When you increase the volume, I have supreme confidence in Mahomes to continue making plays. With Tannehill, he's been good at, okay, I only have to throw you know, four deep shots and five other passes, and they only have to be over the middle off play action. Great. When that isn't possible, I have a lot more confidence yeah. in in Mahomes. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.